we are welcoming, actually welcoming back, the ladies from Mocha Media, um, the sisters Gwen and Angela Alston, um, and their uh, their partner Lisa Smithline. Um, hold on a second while I take it off of speaker view because I just cannot abide by seeing myself talking on a big screen there. Um, uh, last time we talked about impact. Um, uh, this was back in June of 2021. Um, and today we're going to uh, focus more on um, uh, outreach and community engagement. And um, actually, that's a good place to get started. Um, you know, the terms can be confusing. You know, how would, how, um, either of the three of you, like how would you define outreach and community engagement? I mean, how do you distinguish between that and, and impact? Actually, may I ask Gwen to begin? Because Gwen is the queen of clarity when it comes to that distinction and it's incredibly valuable. So thank you, Doug, for leading with that. Thanks. Um, well, Queen of Clarity, it's just I got to be in my bonnet about it because <laughs> when the term impact came on the scene and started being used widely, I realized it, it was becoming a, an abused buzzword and, and it could be um, kind of confusing. So I really made a point of trying to distinguish among the three and, and make definitions, which we also have on our website, in fact. Um, so from my perspective, which we've incorporated into our approach, um, impact is not always going to be the outcome of your campaign. So you, you know, I, and that there, I honestly, there, I feel that there are very few films or projects that necessarily can, you know, you're going to actually say this is an impact campaign, an impact project. Um, our interpretation of what is impact is tangible outcomes based on very specific goals. Um, that said, in all three cases, there are specific goals, but the, the outcomes may be less tangible. So, and when I say tangible, I mean, there's, you know, a change in, a, you know, for example, a legislation passing or, or there's some shift in behavior that can be noted because you've done a survey before and after, and then people can tell you, yes, this film made me really think about what I'm doing and I want to, this is what I'm going to do next. Um, so there's some outcomes that you can see in real life in a, in a kind of a physical or, 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 or dem dem demonstrated way. Whereas for us, outreach is essentially finding, and it's a part of it. So outreach can go with impact um, and it can go with marketing, but it's essentially getting, getting the film to the right partners who, who can become stakeholders in, in your campaign and who will help to carry it along, um, whether it be in organizing screenings or in taking, and, and taking it to their larger community or in supporting your activities in some other way, such as through email, their own email blasts or, or any way in which they will be bringing their membership in and involved in your, in your campaign and in your film. Um, and community engagement just is rather than through organizations, it's literally the community that can be broader. So just, you know, people, people. <laughs> um, and, and in other institutions. And um, so, you know, outreach and community engagement almost kind of fold in on each other, but that's how I would say it. And I don't know if Angela or Lisa would like to, um, add more to that. I think that you you said it very well. 
And um, just for like very quick examples that might be known to everybody, yeah, as you were speaking, I thought of like what happened with the thin blue line. I don't know how many of you saw that film back in the 90s, like that led directly to someone getting released from death row and his conviction getting overturned. And Fantastic Fungi more recently, which is just like, it was an outreach success. Like a bunch of people who love mushrooms and came to love mushrooms went to see it. So I think, I, I hope that helps you get clearer for yourselves about what the difference is. Um, it does. It, it, it's such an interesting example you brought up, though, because, you know, if if Errol Morris were filling out a grant application at the time, I don't think he would have said getting him out of jail was the tangible outcome he was looking for. Um, right. But then I saw it in the theaters in Texas, you know, and like as we left the theater, I, I, I went in the way that I always love to go to a movie, which is to know as little as possible about it. So the whole time I was like, oh my God, is it real? Is it not real? Is it real? Is it not real? And then I figured, you know, partway through, like these people are too quirky to not be real. And then on the way out, we were greeted with a, a campaign that we could join to mm -hmm. help release. Them. So something different happened and, and actually that's a great point that you raised Doug so a filmmaker may have one intention and in that case you know his, probably his intention was to make an absolutely stunning film right which it was I mean and well isn't this one of the issues that we and challenges that we face as filmmakers is that we so often in documentaries go in for one reason we see a great story we get excited about it and it's it's in the process of editing and of you know of shooting it and editing it that we get so caught up in you know and it goes in a different direction and yet part of our fundraising depends on being able to explain what who this audience is and what outcomes we want and how many eyeballs are going to be on it so as a company what do you what do you do when you're approached by a filmmaker who you know, hasn't really thought through that because they're so focused on one, raising the money, but two, just getting the story that they have in their head down. We have two questions that honestly, everyone else in this, in this field are going to ask uh, from John Reese to to Kevin Aqua to, you know, they're, they're all gonna ask the same two questions. We all ask the same question. What are your goals and who's your audience? And you know, take it from there. And it, it has to be, they have to be both clearly defined. Does that, does that mean that they're set in stone? No, because things will shift as you discover along the way. Oh, wait, this, I thought this was my audience, but actually it's also this. I mean, th this is what we've also discovered when we've helped a filmmaker to define their audience, that there have been surprises. Oh, let's test this. No, actually your audience is that or partially this other. But those for us are the two first questions in any, in any first consultation. Yeah. It's interesting that you say that because you know, I do a lot of consulting for other filmmakers. I've also, produced on other documentary films. And, you know, I always ask the director, you know, I, I always the first question are what are your goals and try and work backwards from the goals. But the other one I ask is what's your definition of success? Mm. Um, and uh, that might be like a third one to add, add to this because um, maybe the audience comes out of those two questions. Um, so, uh, I, Let's backtrack a little bit. What does what does Mocha Media do? What um, for those who didn't click on our link in our in our email? Um, explain yourselves. Might I start as the as the newcomer to Mocha yes. Media? Um, I know most of you know Mocha Media at Gwen and Angela. Um, I came to them well in maybe eight nine years ago, so that's not such a newcomer. Um, but as an actual partner 
um, just a few years ago. And um, <clears throat> how I, and I just wanna go back to defining who Mocha Media is and what we do, but also how we present the, to those, actually those same questions. And, and we're all, the first thing that I always think about is what is the story you wanna tell and who wants to hear your story, um, number one. Um, number two, if we don't know, then defining that audience is really, really important. And, and as Gwen said, the surprises are oftentimes the best um, information that we can come up with. Um, but that's, I guess, Mocha, what Mocha Media is and what we do is help us define our audiences and um, help filmmakers define their audiences, help um, them define what their goals are. Um, a lot of times telling the story is so, you know, you're so enmeshed in telling the story that it's hard to think about where it's going to go next and how it's going to connect with audiences and most importantly, um, reach the goals that you have beyond just people watching it, because I think most people have, most filmmakers have goals that are beyond that. So um, what we do, I mean, just on a very specific level is um, uh, offer campaign advice. Um, depending on what type of campaign it is, and Gwen already outlined impact, outreach, and engagement, and and I'm I have trouble extricating those um, because to me um, an impact. I mean, working with an opera can also have an impact. It's just a different kind of impact. So I have a little bit of a, a little harder time defining or pulling them out. Um, but I guess I would say that that that's the most important part to us is connecting the film with the audience. And making sure that those goals are reached. Um, what do you ways say in which we do that? Start from consultation, hourly consultation, to full service, and full service includes actually design designing a whole what we call an outreach plan or an impact plan, depending on the situation, um, where the audience is defined, where the themes are defined, where the keywords are defined. I mean, right now, you know, earlier I was watching a. a an excerpt from the film that we'll be working on today in consultation. And the, the first exercise that I do is write down key words because they, you know, that I, that resonate with me and from come from the film. And then I think, okay, with these key words, what's the audience and what, where do we want to go? And what's the story we want to tell? So that's part of the, the larger campaign. And we also in, in this full service, we think of, we you know we do the outline we do this the the keywords and design a calendar of of what you know what what dates can we kind of latch on hook onto that would be helpful throughout a six month to a twelve month period when you're when you're taking the film forward uh, what kind of distribution is going to happen what are the phases of that distribution how can we help you to execute execute that. And along that also the mark, well, I mean, Angela hates me to use this term, but the marketing elements, <laughs> which include, you know, social media marketing, you know, working on all the, all the accounts, which accounts make this make the most sense and to focus on designing a strategy around that. And then all the, the graphics that go with that as well. We have in-house, we have a, a beautiful in-house uh, graphic designer who helps us to do all the all the design uh, elements for that. So just to give you that full range, so that it's just from hourly, we'll help you, we'll think, work through, you know, tease things out with you in an hourly conversation, or full on, we'll just take it over with you, for you, and completely hands on. Um, and some filmmakers just go, okay, just show me what you got. And others say, I'd like to be more involved. And, and then, you know, there's, there's that. And then there are small teams large teams just also just also give a range of understanding of of what we do um what about filmmakers who come to you without an obvious audience you know they come to you and they say i just want as many eyeballs as possible on this i want pbs i want you know um and by the way that's a perfectly valid thing to just, you know, get a film out as widely, get as much attention and help launch your career and get funding for your next film. But so how do you work with a project like that, that doesn't so clearly have this 
component to it. Well, to tell you the truth, Doug, if it doesn't, if we are not able to help the filmmaker get clear about who the core audience would be, I don't think outreach could be successful. Like we, and, and I don't know that we've ever worked with a project like that. Like if you can't, if you don't know who is going to care. So, so this is how I define the core audience. The core audience are the people who all you need to do is tell them either the title or the subject of the film. And they're like, oh, I want to screen it or I want to see it or I know I would what I would do with that. And I would say, I mean, pretty much that we are always the core audience for the films that we, you know, that we take on, the, the films that we are a fit for. And those are, there's a wide range of films that we've worked with, but if a film is just like, and actually I can't really imagine a film, Doug, to tell you the truth, that someone would have worked on a documentary, that someone would have worked on for like five years, that wouldn't have a core audience for it. That, you know, those people who are just like, yeah, I, I know I wanna to go to the theater to see that movie. I know I wanna watch it on Netflix. And yeah, eventually, yes, you might be, you know, if it gets on, you know, it gets on these channels and or, or streaming, streaming or, you know, classic TV channels, um, great, that's all eyeballs on it. But from the beginning, who's gonna help you support, who's gonna help you to promote it? Who's gonna really support it? Who's gonna give the word of mouth? And that's, you know, that's where the core audience does come in. Um, and it's, it's useful to, 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 to know who they are along the way from the very beginning, just even from, from the, the moment you've, you've started work on your film. By the way, I totally see the value of coming in to, you know, companies like yours or anyone who can help you identify your target audiences and things like that. And, you know, we're always, I'm playing devil's advocate a bit here. Um, you know, the, the, the tough part is, you know, yes, of course, we'd want to work with you as early as possible, but that's when we have no money. We can't even get our film, you know, shot or you know, filmed or, or, you know, uh, all the other things. And then we're told, you know, let's start our social media campaign. And, uh, you know, it's also overwhelming. So what, how, how do you answer that? I mean, I know I would love to be able to come to you right off the bat, um, uh, but you don't work for free, do you? Uh, no, we don't work for free. And, and, and that is a very, you know, that's an important question. Um, way back when I first started doing this, um, we did not shoot one frame or even uh, have an outline until we already had our distribution, at least uh, our distribution goals in mind to some extent. And so that was from, part from the very, very beginning. And as much as I understand, you know, the budget of production and all of that is so important, but if you spend all the time and energy making your film and an afterthought or, you know, after um, raising money is, is the most important thing, to me, that's, that's a mistake and, um, and can be easily rectified by just putting one more uh, line on the budget. Doesn't have to be huge, but it has to be a goal and um, maybe a consultation. So you at least understand, because there's things along the way that you might trip over that would be quite helpful if you hadn't tripped over them by knowing that those, you know, even things like your, your uh, subjects in your film that might be connected to large audiences, um, but you didn't develop that relationship in that way. They were just a subject of your film, not just, but they were a subject of your film and therefore an important part of your film. But if you integrate them as an important part of your distribution um, from the get-go, it is then a much more imp uh, uh, impactful way to work. So, yeah. No, I, I'm piggybacking. Two, two, okay, you two, go two find things. <laughs> two things. I'd like Lisa to please say, go back and say, what she's talking about when she says she worked in production with Robert uh, Greenwald, um, because she didn't clarify that earlier, but where her or 
surgeons are and in that sense. And second, I would also say, um, I mean, a good example of, of you don't have to hire us or anyone. Um, start thinking for this on your own though, as a filmmaker mm -hmm. and a good example of filmmakers who I think have who've done this masterfully are, you know, Almudena uh, Carraceda and Robert Bahar with, you know, for example, Made in LA and The Silence of Others. In both cases, from the get-go, from the inception of their films, they were already thinking, who are our strategic partners? What do we want to do with this film? Who's going to be on board with us from day one? And they worked that. And The Silence of Others was masterfully done, especially considering that in Spain, people don't understand outreach. They don't understand impact. And to get stakeholders involved here, they did a whole circular campaign where everything happened on the outside of the country so that there was, it was so clear that the film was, had, a, had a recognition. And then in Spain, it could then get the success it needed to get all eyeballs on it. But they started from the beginning and that's how they got these, these wonderful connections on board with them. So that's one. And Lisa, please, you know, clarify and, also and your actually, origin, can I just please, because I think in. that's important. So, so I'd like to hop in quickly before Lisa shares her background. So the, the, the mistake that filmmakers make is to think that the seeing, the watching, the life of their film in the world is separate from the making of the film. It's all one thing. It's like you, you want to have a child, right? And you're planning for the child. Is there any way that you wouldn't think, oh, the child is going to go to school. I want to help the child have friends. I want to help the child succeed and not need me anymore. You wouldn't do it. It's exactly the same thing when you're making a movie. Um, yes, that, and then we often say that, or I do anyway, that, that this is, you know, now your film is your baby and we're going to help you get it out into the world, um, help it make friends, to use Angela's words, help find partners that will help you get, um, get your film seen by many more people. And um, so I, my background is I come actually as a, from a community organizing background. So um, I've been doing some form of outreach and impact pretty much all my life. Um, and my professional background, that was my volunteer background, my professional background comes from um, actually um, production, television, and commercial. I was an art director and set decorator, and then um, met Robert Greenwald on what used to be called Movies of the Week when I was um, art directing, and um, the documentaries that we first, he first produced, um, I was brought in to help connect it with those with audiences. And um, at the time, we didn't have any terminology. We called it alternative marketing at the time. Um, this was a long time ago, um, a long, long time ago. Um, and it has evolved since then. Alternative marketing became outreach, community engagement. And it always was community engagement in my regard, in my opinion, just because we had to find the communities that were going to be interested. And then we could expand. I believe in casting a hugely wide net but I also believe in building the foundation first. So that's, um, I guess, and, and then that goes back to how we work. Um, Angela talks a lot about core audience, um, but we do, you know, we find oftentimes what, what I call unusual partners, you know, sometimes somebody that we wouldn't ever think of that become very invested. So um, that's, you know, and, and it's, it's always an evolving process. Gwen, I think you made a really wise comment earlier when you said, you know, um, if nothing else, come to us early for a consult, you know, to help think through these questions, because, you know, we are going to be asked on these funding applications, you know, what are, what are your goals? Who's your audience? What's your outreach plan? And, you know, we really do have to start thinking about those things. So what, um, in preparation for that kind of consult for the first time we talked to you, what, What's, what's the best way that filmmakers can prepare to, or other than just give you a synopsis of the film and tell you I haven't really thought of outreach? <laughs> I think I'll just jump in. I think that, you know, a filmmaker's position is 
to make their film. I mean, that's their job. Um, our job is to help them find and, and define the, the distribution plan and the, um, where their audience is. Um, so coming to us with whatever you got, what's your story? Um, what are your goals? Who do you want to tell your stories to? Who do you think would be interested? That's enough. It's our job then to come up with the other part. It's not theirs. And, and as Gwen said, you know, an initial consultation just to have it in mind so that it can help inform part of the production process, um, but also just always be part of what a filmmaker is thinking is in my mind as, you know, the, one of the most important things, if you don't build the foundation from the beginning, you're backtracking and having to, you know, kind of put the bricks on afterwards, it's much easier to put the bricks on first. So that's, but, but it isn't a filmmaker's job to do that. In my opinion, it's ours and we help them evolve, you know, with those questions by asking questions and guiding, you know, the conversation. This, that this said, scene. we've also, we've also, we've also worked with films that have, you know, are already locked that have already premiered at a festival that have, I mean, we even worked with a film that premiered. This was, this was actually remarkable for us in a way. Uh, we, we worked with a film that had premiered four years earlier, had done very well in the, in the UK and wanted to really be released in, um, in the US. And on top of that, was this just before COVID or was it? <laughs> um, it was during so, COVID, I think COVID hit yeah, in the middle. And, yeah. Right, right in the middle of the campaign. And, you know, we, we, what we did in that circumstance, I mean, a film that was already had launched four years previously on TV, and it had done a festival circuit, the whole thing. And what we suggested to them, and that has also worked well, is an exploratory month where we said, okay, these are, these, these are your goals. This is what you want to do. You want to release in the US in this impactful way um, in the sense of getting, well, impactful in a sense, you want certain organizations to be involved and, and you want them to have a call to action. So that, that's also very important. And, um, you want a big release. And then there are other assumptions of these are the organizations that are actually going to participate. So there's all these assumptions and this, and that there's, the, there's going to be a ready-made audience four years later and for a topic that in and of itself was, you know, a big squeeze into, <laughs> um, you know, wasn't, wasn't exactly, how do you make it timely again as the topic? Gwen, right? would, would you, Tell us a little bit more about. I'll ask, I'm going to ask Lisa to talk about. Oh, okay, about right, cool. But uh, so I just want to give the broad. So what we did is we had an exploratory month. Let's te let's test those assumptions, and let's test those. If those let's let's reach those organizations, contact those organizations that the filmmaker had already come up with, and that we were thinking about, and and see if they would be willing. If there was a full campaign and a release and so forth, would they be on board? Would they bring their membership? Would they be involved in some way? Would they help us spread the word? Did they think this film made sense at this point as a tool for uh, raising awareness and for change? And we've discovered at the end of the month that indeed that was the case. So then a campaign could actually be developed and launched. And that was, a, I, I will admit, it was an unusual circumstance and we were, and we were able to work with the filmmaker to, to, to make it work because there was something there to work with. And Lisa can give the details of the film. And just to go back a little bit, so the what we went in really not knowing, um, you know, if in fact our assumptions were going to be um, proven correct or not, or if we were gonna be surprised. Um, the one thing that I will say, uh, uh, and this film was called We Are Many. Um, it's a beautiful film about the um, protests uh, against the Iraq war filmed in the UK. Um, but this was back in what 2020, I guess, um, that the film was going to be released in the U.S. So it was, you know, quite a, a long time since the original. Re I guess the original release was maybe I don't remember. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, I, but the film was a beautiful film. Number one, it was a, a wonderful film that really had a lot of passion and emotion and was very relatable. Um, and the assumptions that we had, you know, the organizations that we assumed would be interested, um, we were very pleasantly surprised um, that they all were, 
um, incredibly so, and became very invested partners in the um, in the release uh, because the story was relevant. A lot of the organizations had been part of the story here in the U.S., and the story had not been told um, to their audiences in the same way that it had been in the U.K. Um, so we were really pleasantly surprised, and and then we did have to. Um, pivot quite a lot because we were planning a theatrical, you know, theatrical and then, you know, community um, release. And um, all of a sudden we were in the virtual world. And how did we do that? And, and you know, we had started because I, I think we had already started in, on other projects um, with virtual release, but it was quite a surprise to, um, to have to shift entirely. Um, but we were I mean, I was very, very pleasantly surprised and um, and thrilled. And but a lot of it went into building the foundation, finding those organizations, really developing um, a shared passion for the topic, a shared passion for getting the word out to their audiences, and defining the call to action, um, which was relevant still to this day to all of the organizations that were either represented or partnered with us. Yes, and the, and the top, you know, what happened is we we realized that these organizations were actively involved in what the, you know, there's still still need for anti-war um, act, actions and activity. Then you're folding into, you know, the um, Black Lives Matter, and then you're folding into, you know, and an, nonviolence in general, and and also, you know, having a, a tool for, for um, kind of confronting the kind of language that was coming out of the Trump administration. So it was actually quite timely in the end, even though it was specifically talking about a march that took place against the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan. The still the anti-war message, the anti-violence messages, and the you know the 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 response to this kind of thinking from our from well UK or US governments was still valid. So it it did it, it, it that that's an example. And, and just to things... jump in for one second, sorry, oh. just to jump in because Gwen mentioned Black Lives Matter as this was what evolved. You know, our assumptions in the beginning were anti-war specifically, but you know, at the time, the Black Lives Matter uh, and, you know, the protests here in LA and across the world, or LA, the United States and across the world were occurring. And it was so relevant that we were able to expand something that, you know, was, I guess, you know, wasn't in the consciousness of the film or the filmmaker or the experience at the time that it was being made. So one of the things that, that, that came to me this morning as I was thinking about this conversation, was sort of five words and they are patience, painstaking, persistence, pivot and partner. So they're all key really to a successful campaign. It's not gonna happen overnight. And you'll hear, you know, about films that have made millions and millions of dollars and, you know, and those are amazing and they're unicorns. And the success of an impact campaign, it's just like when you're, when you're sitting down to edit your movie, you're, you need all those tools when you're editing and you need those tools when you're doing an impact campaign also. The five Ps. Um... Well, a lot of people are going to be relieved to hear that you come on late in the game. It was a, a, a number of people asked that question in the chat, and there are actually some great questions there. And I'll just tell everybody that um, we are going to—I promise you—we're going to a lot, a lot of time for your questions. Um, uh, but first, we're going to segue into uh, one of the highlights of today's session, which is um, a little mini consult. Um, um, Gwen and Angela and Lisa asked that, um, or offered, um, that we submit, uh, our members submit projects, their projects to them if they were interested in having a little, a, a demo of a mini consult. 
Um, and I believe you got 17 submissions. And I want to say by way of caveat, um, I'm quite aware of this project. Um, Dempsey Rice is one of the longest uh, surviving D Word members. She was here from our very first year. Um, and Lori Cheadle has been my producing partner for the past 20 plus years. On my, we're now working on our fourth film together. So um, uh, I, it's a great project. I will let you guys take it from there. Um, and uh, Julie, please take me off spotlight and just put it on um, Dempsey, Laurie, and the Mocha folks. And then afterwards, we'll go into if, if I may, I just yeah. Sorry, Doug. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead, Doug. Excuse me. No, I, I just was... wanted to first say thank. Go ahead, Gwen. Okay, I just first wanted to say thank you to everyone who submitted their films for us to to look at. I mean, we were really, I feel really honored and thankful and, and um, appreciative of all these projects and, and what they're aiming to do. Um, so thank you for that. It was not an easy decision, <laughs> but um, anyway, we're, we've, we're also available to everyone else for any questions that you may have aside from that aside from today so anyway we'll after that we'll launch in with then CMO so yeah so maybe um if I could Dempsey I would invite you to tell us a little bit about your movie um so Gosh, I didn't know I was going to have to like do a pitch. <laughs> <laughs> Don't think of it as a pitch. It's not a pitch. Uh, it's just like this is how we start our conversation. Yeah. So we're doing it. It's like real time. This okay, is how good. we start our conversation. Um, so the animated mind of Oliver Sacks is a documentary about author and neurologist Oliver Sacks. It is a film that is not a traditional biopic. I mean, it does have biographical elements, but um, if people are familiar, I should say very briefly, if you don't know who Oliver Sacks is, you should run and find out. But he uh, wrote books like The Anthropologist on Mars, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, and Awakenings. Awakenings was made into a Hollywood film starring Robert De Niro and Robin Williams. Uh, he was a neurologist who practiced in very um, sort of off the beaten path ways. He was, he, he practiced a real, a, a real sort of form of compassionate care. He's very interested in, in um, patient stories and very much worked with patients who, uh, there were no cures. They had lifelong neurological disabilities that impacted them. And he was, he was more curious, sure, he could help manage symptoms. But he was very curious about uh, how people lived with neurological disorder. So the film is a balance between Oliver's biographical story and really his story as a doctor. It's focused on a specific, uh, a generally a specific era from the 60s to the 80s of Oliver's process of sort of becoming uh, the neurologist that, you know, he the becoming, yes, he became famous, but really become, coming into his own as a neurologist and figuring out how he wanted to work with patients um, the, the universal aspects of the story, I mean, really, he is a guy who struggled a lot himself, he had a lot of issues, depression, uh, traumatic experiences as a child, and his own uh, sort of uh, evolution parallels um, his connection to patients. Um, gosh, Lori, help me out. Uh, you know, basically, it's a film that's about a man and his own life, but his work as a, neuro as a, as a sort of compassionate uh, cutting edge neurologist who. And we wanted to do that to some degree. I mean, it's it focuses also on the patients and case histories. Yeah. And, it's, uh, you know, if people know who Oliver Sacks is, you might know that there have been other, you know, projects, BBC has, you know, other things have been done. But this one takes place at such an, an earlier part of his life um, when he was, you know, 
essentially a young doctor. And it uses all sorts of um, archival material that's never been seen before. His audio tapes, you know, hundreds of audio tapes, a lot of uh, 1970s porta pack and we use a lot of animation uh, to sort of, uh, because we have audio of some of the interactions with patients. So a lot of that uh, is, is going to be animated. Um, and I don't know. Uh, uh. I feel I like I like no, in, no, in, I like wonderful. it perfect. I I like what um one of the things he says when when you're hearing his his recording uh when he talks about how basically his you know this is what he's doing is the kind of a combination of biography and biology. Yeah. Um in his in his self recording and so that's you know that kind of seems to be really significant about how he how the rest of his life evolves and his work um, and also what the film is doing, right? As you just stated. So bio biography and biology seem to be good keywords in that sense. Yeah. Um, two questions I have are, what inspired you to, to make this film and what do you want to achieve with it? I met Oliver Sacks in the, in I think 2000, maybe it was 2001, I think it was 2000. I was a radio producer for a show called The Infinite Mind, which was about all kinds of brain issues. He was a guest, he talked about Tourette syndrome. Um, so a couple of years later, I was making a short film about memory. I really wanted to interview Oliver. The, the person that came with him to this interview, to the studio to do this radio interview, and, and I'd, been a, I'd been reading him since, uh, probably the anthropologist on Mars, the mid, the early '90s is when I found him. Um, so I was making this film. I wanted to interview Oliver. I had gotten to be good friends with his what I called second assistant. So Kate Edgar worked with Oliver for over 30 years, and there was a series of um, uh, sort of second people who would work in the office helping support Kate and Oliver. Uh, I'd gotten to be good friends with her and I said, Cheryl, I really want to interview Oliver for this little film I'm making. And she said, Oliver has no time. I love you so much, MC, but he's never going to do that. And I was like, come on, you know, every, every, but I, come on, Cheryl, help me out. No, I can't do that. Eventually what happened was he could not attend an event and wanted to send a video message. And so Cheryl said, well, if you come record this video message, you can interview him about your film at the same time. So, you know, just me being persistent, also having a good friend. So I interviewed him over the course of the next 10 years, like it went well. And so I kept going back and it was uh, often around, well, most of my interviews were dealt with personal, but really around case history and patient, his work with patients and, um, you know, things he'd been writing, patients he'd been writing about. So that, so when Oliver, Oliver's now dead, you may or may not know that he died in 2015. Um, in 2015, when it became clear that he was going to die, that he had this cancer that had spread, he was going to die. Um, I was like, okay, I've got all this material. What, you know, what can I do with it? And at first I thought I would make a film just on my material. And through a series of conversations, I found out about this archive, all these audio tapes uh, and videotapes that had never been seen before. I asked for access, they gave me access and the film kind of exploded from there. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot the second question. So that's my connection to Oliver. And I mean, you know, I love Oliver. He's fascinating, he's brilliant, he's a genius. He's compassionate, you know, he's a great character. But there was a second question. Second question, Dempsey, is what would you like to see happen because of the movie? I want people to see it. <laughs> you know, here's the thing. You know, this definition of impact versus um, outreach was super helpful. There is no, like, I want someone to go sign this thing. I want someone to release somebody from prison. There is no immediate sort of impactful goal. Um, I think the values that the film is expressing, the values that Oliver expressed, that of compassionate care, health care that looks at whole people, health care that takes time around people, um, health care that's interested in a patient's narrative and not just in testing, diagnosing, giving pills. You know, sometimes, I, hey, 
testing, diagnosing, giving pills, doing an operation, that's all necessary. I'm not arguing against those things. I'm arguing for a sort of possibly greater view of healthcare. Um, I think, you know, to talk about those issues is valuable um, and important in today's world. I mean, we're in a post-pandemic world where suddenly it all got super real. Um, I, there are certainly, um, neurological disorders that uh, I think Oliver was at the forefront of starting to talk about Tourette syndrome. He, you know, very early wrote about um, uh, Temple Grandin, who's very famous as an autistic uh, savant, but as a, you know, for, for her work in terms of uh, slaughterhouses, but also she's very famous as an autistic person and an advocate for autism. So he was very early on several different neurological disorders just talking about them, writing about people's stories. So, you know, I think adding to those conversations is has value as well. Um, I think we also, Dempsey Wright, we want to introduce him to a, a audience that might not know him, particularly yeah. a younger audience. And, you know, we, we were talking to somebody a while ago who does a, a lot of um, work in statistics around the movie business. <laughs> and, you know, this idea of this, you know, like a Gen Z generation, their, their interest in things like diversity, like, you know, um, you know, Oliver had his own personal struggles. And, you know, just, I think, finding ways into these audiences that will then introduce them to this larger body of work and all the different things that, you know, he sort of um, talked about in a way that nobody did. I mean, his own, you know, for those who don't know him, his books are generally very friendly for reading. They're not strict science books. They tell about case histories in a way that is, is like storytelling. So, you know. Uh, and just to just to add a, a little tidbit, um, I, and I don't know that it's well known, but there was an opera made out of um, one of his books, the um, the, the man, and man who, who was, hat. yeah, which was a fabulous way to introduce his work to right. um, a completely different audience. Yeah. And, and I saw it, and it was at, really wonderfully done, very innovative. Yeah. Um, Michael and, Nyman. And, yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, just to I, I mean, thank you so much. Uh, I, I think I am all of the core audiences um, <laughs> for your film. So I was very excited to see it. Um, I've been, I've known about him. I, I especially, um, and I remember well, my dad had Parkinson's, so I remember very, very well yeah. um, his work before even, before the film and yeah. um, the yeah. research that he did um, and what inspired, you know, all of that. Um, yeah. But the, and I think also just the, the and I don't want to get too much into him, but just, I, you know, you can tell I'm the core audience because I'm so excited about him. Um, but I do think that when you have a character like that, a main character with so much dimension, there are so many ways that your film can reach, you know, beyond just what might be a core one, one core audience, but right. audiences, as you said. And in particular, at this time, I'm I'm struck by what, um, you know, the compassionate and and the holistic view of of um, healthcare, which I think is you know, it has always been a emerging um, issue, but it's never really been pinpointed. And to have somebody that can demonstrate it in a way that is, um, you know, very practical. Um, could be incredibly instructive in, in medical school, et cetera. So um, anyway, that's just to say that that's how I would start um, working with the film, but I'm going to, I'm going to. No, yeah, I, I totally agree something. with you, Lisa, that in terms of the low hanging fruit. So when, when I think about core audience, I, I think about the low hanging fruit. I mean, cause yeah. you, you did say, yeah, they're like the film could you know, neurodiversity, like all these different things, and you are not wrong, but then the question is, you know, who do you choose first? Yeah. And who is easy to target? Yeah. And so where I went was two different places. I, I went AARP, start a conversation with them because they show movies. Huh. They are interested in, in healthcare reform. 
And they have a lot of members and they have a lot of clout. And by the way, for those who do not know, I was very surprised to learn, but I had lunch with someone who was like part of um, the C-suite for AARP Texas. And they're like, we define our membership as beginning at age 50 and above. So I was like, holy smokes, that's a lot of people. Didn't, didn't, I don't know if you're over 50, but when I turned 50, when my wife turned 50, we started getting mailers from the AARP and we were like, no. We're I know it is so creepy. Like, how do they even know? But on the other hand, they do, they are well organized. And yeah. this is the perfect time for you to start a conversation with them right. because it's going to take a long time because they're a huge organization. And what we've yeah. discovered is the little guys have less money, but they're much more nimble, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so that's, that's one thing. The other thing is, is the healthcare system, which, you know, we recently worked with a film called Anxious Nation. And as somebody, one of the experts in there said, our system isn't broken. It never worked. So this is a wonderful film to bring to, and those organizations already exist too, that are right. working in the arena of, of creating a healthcare system that is going to work. Right. And, um, you know, it hasn't completely broken down, but, you know, for example, you know, I recently moved to this area and I chose my PCP. Well, okay, my first appointment with her is a year out. Cheap. Yeah, for my just for my annual exam. Yeah. yeah. So okay, so and then so I would start with with those like big organizations, just start the conversation. And by the way, you mentioned how can I do that in, in, in what you send to us? Well, we need to raise money to finish the film. This is part of raising the money to yeah. finish your film. Right. When you go to these people, you can be showing, offering them excerpts. You right. can be like show this at your conference and show an excerpt, invite me and, you know, pay me. And, you know, so, so this is like a win, win, win. Right. Because, you know, literally all I had to do was like read about your movie. And I was like, oh, my God, I have to see this movie. Right. I, I want to jump in um, another aspect that excited me. Um, and I only saw, you know, the very small excerpt. Um, but Temple Grandin was mentioned. And Temple Grandin is an amazing character in and of herself with yeah. a huge network and a huge following. A movie was made about her or more than one, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so this is where I go to, like, did you think about this when you were making the film and establish a relationship with her as well yeah. as a partner, um, you know, in the distribution of your film? Because, you know, their relationship was fabulous. And I'm sure she would want to be part of the promotion of something that was about his life's work in, in addition to about her, but about other things right. as well, things that she right. is passionate and cares about. Right. And and, and, just, with, and with that, you're tapping right into, as you said, I mean, it is now becoming more and more an outspoken matter to discuss narrow di neurodiversities of yeah. very of, of all kinds. And as you rightfully said, Nori, with re with regards to youth and yeah. concerns about youth, but also just across the board. Now we're understanding how to look at people at all ages and what these quirks are <laughs> right which turn out to be you know certain it, just aspects of neurodiverse ways of being yeah and, yeah, and that's that is a great that point that's becoming when... more a part of the this, yes yeah Go that on. that that people are discovering you know i just was speaking with someone in her 50s who was like oh, i just learned i was adhd that explains so much about me Mm. So, but what I would say is don't focus on what well, we want to introduce Oliver to a younger generation. No, I, I understand that. I, I mean, I, I'm with you, but it's the- And the, the animation easier... will certainly help. It's the great end. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and then the other thing is like, of course, 
the queer audience. Yeah. Like they're so beautifully organized already, right? Yeah. And, you know, I had no idea until I watched the documentary, I guess it's on Netflix, that Oliver Sacks was queer. And then I was like, oh my God, just, just other dimensions are like all around, just so, yeah. yeah. And that is your entree too to younger audiences because the the you know the grappling with is something that that young people young people that are you know grappling with um, could really learn from his experience you know be, right. or, and be comforted by um, his experience in a way that it, it doesn't have to be this way um, and I'm not saying that his struggle you know and who he became wasn't in part because of his struggle but it certainly you know, did in, inform some of it. Right. It's, it informed his compassion for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And then you can fold into speaking of compassion, because of course that was one of the first words that came to me, empathy and then, and compassion, you know, is, is consider the communities of people who are cultivating compassion and uh -huh the organizations that are involved in cultivation of compassion who are directly or indirectly involved with the healthcare system in various ways. So they are also very responsive, active communities and that that goes into the interfaith and that goes into, you know, you, you, you do have um, that, that area to explore as well. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to jump in for a second um, to say that we just have a few more minutes left of this before we go to questions. Um, so if you have any final thoughts, remarks. I, I, I want to ask yes, one question I have, that I don't think I have, I, that we yeah. asked. May, may I first go just quickly? I don't think we asked um, about your, I think I remember reading, you know, there's a theatrical goal and, you know, but what, uh, apart from the traditional, have you thought much about what your goals are as far as actually when, you know, the distribution, when it's when it's ready? Well, I mean, we have the traditional, you know, theatrical streamer broadcast. So, uh, you know, I don't want to bore you with- Festival, no festival. Yes, festivals. Festival. Like we all, we, yes, we want all the things. Um, I didn't detail that in the stuff I wrote because so I right. basically said, you know, yes, we want all those things. But the, I mean, beyond that, I think the goal is to get as many people to see it as can, which is, you know, maybe an absurd goal. I don't know. Maybe what does that mean? How how does that how do you define that specifically? Like I don't have an easy answer to that. And you don't have 350 million friends? No. <laughs> send it to no, you. and I don't have 350 yeah. million followers. Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but and I do have okay, so great. So one thing I do want to jump in and say very quick, Dempsey, what is going to be key to the success of this movie is to bring life back to your social feed. Like, yeah. I, I visited all of them and- yeah, I know, they're dead in the water. I am. Yes, they are. They can yeah. be revived. And, you know, and that is not separate from your fundraising. Yeah, you're right. It's hard. It's and very it's so hard. Work. It's, it's very it's, time consuming. And I know. And that's why it's, you, it's you, storytelling, you, whatever you like, think right. of who, if you're going to call your best friend and you want to like tell them about anything that has yeah. inspired you in the day, it does not have to be about the film, but right. there's something that's relevant because the, the richness of the film, the fact that you have, that, that this man had so many layers means that you don't have to talk about just one thing. So you're going to get, you can get the attention to the social media um, accounts through right. all these various topics that are meaningful to you as well. I mean, right. the point is to have this voice that is talking to their best friend or to other people that you, you know, you want to really literally engage with in right. a particular way. And and, but it doesn't have that. to be, about the film, as I said, it's about the topics, the themes in the film, about current okay. events that have to do with these topics. Yes, and, 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 to, and to build on that, so when you're doing that on socials, that also is an email, because you're collecting emails, which is great, but please also collect in, in that very first thing, the pop-up, collect first names and last names, because Gmail, 
distributes mail differently depending on whether there's a first name and last name in it as opposed to just the email if right you're, if you're mailing from mailchimp so collect that and then right. also engage with that mailing list yeah once a month like i know you're having every day you're having ideas about the movie just yeah. like speak them whatever is the easiest way for you to do it right put them down you don't don't try to make it a polished thing and just send them out because that audience is going to care right they already well, care quotes from quotes them. from his books quotes mm -hmm. from his recordings Articles right. that are relevant to neurodiversity, articles that are relevant to LGBT, LGBTQ issues, right. articles right. that are relevant to healthcare. Um, you Excerpts know, things that the will be also uh, things that will be helpful for your readership. Right. I, I think we're almost out of time, but I would just say that what then after you know, let, I think we're you know showing a little bit about how Mocha works. Um, what we would do next is we would follow up with what we would recommend, right. um, what services we offer, whether, and I think Gwen already went through them, you know, whether it would be a, a consultation, consultation hourly or an exploratory campaign to help define and, and um, gauge the audience um, and, and the different ways right. that it might connect with the audiences and a full campaign. So that was, that would be what we would do. Next. Got it. We're, we're very appreciative of uh, yes. yeah. having this That's opportunity. Idea. Thank That's you really so good. much. <laughs> and hopefully we can continue the conversation. I, I knew yeah. 20 minutes would be tough. It's a tough <laughs> uh, mini consult, but um, uh, thank you guys for offering to do this. And um, I'll just add personally, I, I, Dempsey is a fabulous filmmaker. Lori is a, a, a very humble person. So I'm just going to embarrass her and say she's in my opinion, the best producer working in documentary. Agree. And uh, a nicer person you will never meet. Um, and um, the, the project is great and uh, look forward to seeing it very soon. So um, thank, you. thank you guys for, um, for doing this consult and giving really excellent demonstration of what um, the process is like to work with, you know, not just Mocha, media but like you know really any any company any consultant who knows their stuff and be, would be working with you um there were just a ton of really good questions in the chat and um i don't want to ask for you this is the time for you to come on camera and ask them so use the raised hand function um raise your hand and we'll call on you um and we've allotted um you know, a decent amount of time for you to do that. So, um, Mabel, you were the first. Ask, uh, ask away. Hello, um, and thank you so much for an incredible, <laughs> such a valuable, incredible um, webinar. Thank you all from Mocha, it's amazing. And thank you, the world. Um, so my question is, uh, when you were talking about um, who's your core audience, uh, you know, filmmakers, like me, may have a defined core audience that is like the low hanging fruit. But then also, it, you know, let, let's say that the issue is, you know, uh, let's say mental health care for all. Let's say that that's the issue. So we know that uh, uh, pro organizations that are pro that are going to mostly be interested. But if you really want to expand the conversation beyond like preaching to the core, you also want to target those uh, organizations that are not pro, but it may be even against it, or maybe may, maybe in a neutral position. So I, that's my, uh, I think it is, is, I don't know if it's a question per se, but it's more like, don't we want to target them as well? Or, or is it better as you were demonstrating that to always go for the more accessible first and then go for the second one later? That's my, uh, my main question. The second question is mostly like in the social media part uh, is kind of mine. So do you, uh, do you recommend mostly social media um, presence in your existing um, film profile, let's say in Facebook, as opposed to your personal, you're trying to do both? Thank you. 
Um, just to, to, uh, to answer your first question first, I think, um, you know, we always say uh, define and, and go after the core audience. That's the best place to start, but we cast a very wide net, as I hope we um, described. And, um, and oftentimes, uh, our assumptions are approved that there are many other ways and directions to go. So yes, we, you know, it's a yes and, I guess. It, um, we use the word and a lot um, because that, you know, we don't like to confine ourselves. And um, maybe I'll let Angela or Gwen answer your second question. Um, I would recommend, again, this goes to what Doug was saying before about if you want the continuation in your professional life, that you would be using either if you have a production company, you might use that, those social media, that social media account, like I would say Mocha Media, you know, productions, then we all our films might go under those accounts. Or, well, and Angela might disagree because, you know, sometimes we also do or just specifically for the film. Um, I think if it's your personal one, that might be confusing. But in fact, it it's, might be ben more beneficial to you to have your personal one that relates to the film socials, as well as anybody else who's on the, in the crew should be using their personal accounts to relate to the film socials as well and help to give it more visibility. I hope that answers that second question. Yeah, so following up on what you said, Gwen, I mean, it's not, I think it's on a case by case basis. So some films are clearly gonna take on a life of their own. And for example, Fantastic Fungi, like that definitely needed its own platform separate from anything else. But if you know, I'm, you know, I'm interested in, let's say, films about Israel. And this is, I'm working on a, on a film right now about Israel. And then I know my next films are going to continue to address that subject. Then maybe you wouldn't create a separate social presence. You would do it as your production company. Oh, and speaking to audience, I mean, the reason to go for the low hanging fruit is they have friends, they have family. It's not when you reach the, the your core audience, you're reaching other people too through them. But your idea is to make it as easy as quick for yourself. And it's not that said, it's not usually quick and it's not easy, but it's easier if somebody is already invested, if someone is already can leverage their existing mission with your film, as opposed to speaking to someone who is opposed to your film or doesn't care about your film. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on, Wendy. Hi, uh, first of all, this is really uh, enlightening. So thank you so much for all the information. Um, I am nearly done with the film, actually about mental health, about anxiety through the eyes of comedians. And uh, I'm just trying to learn about all the different possibilities of how to get the film out there. Um, I think there will be a lot, there will be a lot of potential for audience uh, interest. Um, and I'm my, I guess my first question, my main question is, um, if I were to pursue, uh, you know, more traditional distribution, trying to get the film, um, you know, a distribution deal with the streamer, do you work with films who are pursuing that um, and do traditional stream, I mean, do streamers, are they open to the kind of work that you're doing like if I wanted to do a combination is that is that something that's possible or is it a matter of choosing traditional distribution versus uh you know the more uh you know grassroots community outreach which I'm very interested in I'm interested in both at the moment and I'm trying to sort it all out there's where the word and comes in um <laughs> definitely there is no one or the other um, and, and streamers, for example, are quite interested in anything that you as a filmmaker are going to be doing to bring more audience to the film. 
Um, so, and, and anybody, any distrib distribute, any um, type of distributor is going to want that assistance, whether from you or with um, a, a consultants that could help you broaden your audience. So I, I, I don't think there's any limitations that should ever and could ever be put on. It's more a matter of what, you know, budget obviously, but whoever and whatever your goals are, it's a matter of maximizing the audience. That would yeah, be a few of the films that we've worked with have been on streamers. And in one case in particular, the filmmaker was dead set on that film appearing on Netflix. And there was no conflict whatsoever. On the contrary, the campaign that we had been running with them along the way helped to support the, the, the launch of the film, then eventually on the streamer, um, which because it was a film about veterans, it was launched on November 11th. So there was this whole way in which we could relate to, you know, to Veterans Day and, and supporting that release. So on the contrary, and since, you know, they're, they're going to do what they do to do their marketing, i.e. the streamers, um, any, any bit that we do for the film and the filmmaker is, is just, you know, it's uh, cherry on top. I, I right. want to jump in too on, on just the, the, you know, the landscape, as you all know, changes daily, I think, you know, and the traditional distribution landscape is going to be changing over and over and over again. Um, I think the films Gwen was just mentioning, for example, had a community, basically a theatrical that got, um, I think, shunted by COVID and then virtual community. Then it went to Netflix for four or five years, and now it's having a public television release. So, you know, all of those windows that people talk about and possibilities that don't exist do exist. So um, keep that in mind. Okay. That's so Lisa, fun. what is that film? Um, that one's called To Be of Service. I think it was from 2019, 2020. Um, yes. And yes, I, we just learned yesterday or day before that, you know, after this long time, it's now going to public television and national carriage too, not, not just one. So as I said, throw out all of those assumptions and you'll be better off, my opinion. Thank you so much. Thanks for asking, Wendy. And check the chat. You got quite a compliment in there. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, Nancy Rosenblum. <laughs> Hi, hey. so many questions, so little time. Um, thank you for being here. I'm just wondering what your initial consult or interview fee is. The first conversation, which is a 30 minute conversation is free of charge. Okay. And um, it, it seems I'm in development um, on a, a doc called Cycling with the Ghost of Kitty Knox. She was a black cyclist in 1890s Cambridge and people that she's inspired currently that are cyclists. And um, it, yeah, I'm just stumped of how to start, to, you know, I'm getting a pitch deck together, but how to raise money, I'm just like a person. So uh, questions along those lines of like, is it legitimate for me to ask people for money and how do I do that? We are not fundraisers, but we do have you know, a lot of experience um, in intersecting with the different funders and advising, um, but we are not fundraisers ourselves. But I think um, that's part of, you know, we understand that money doesn't just exist in a pot. I think it does to some people, but not too many. Um, so we understand that, you know, that's a big factor. And, um, and so, you know, and I can't tell you right now, but we would definitely help brainstorm what those possibilities could be. So then if, so what is your Ben main function? Sorry, I must've missed it. Uh, it's, it's connecting, it's, it's either impact campaigns, it's, it's developing in campaigns, impact campaigns, community engagement campaigns, um, marketing, social media, uh, fundraising is not our, you know, but we understand that funding needs to happen. So that's, you know, but we are not fundraisers. Thank you. We, we can point people to 
experts in fundraising. And we, we like, and in fact, I'm very eager to continue to co collect uh, the names of people that we think, you know, and, and meeting with them that we think are appropriate to, to, to reference. Um, and as Lisa said, yes, we have experience in the fundraising um, activity, you. but <laughs> yeah, but and you know, when we can advise one way or another, but we don't, we we do, are not involved in the fundraising itself. Only just to say that we, you know, oftentimes have been called upon to use um, our writing about our proposal and what we're recommending for the film and for the campaign. Um, that oftentimes can fit into, I think Doug mentioned this early on, can fit into uh, applications to grants because they're going to be asking you, you know, who is your audience? What are your goals? Um, but that's as far as we take it. But yes, we do have okay. professionals that, that we could recommend and are always looking for more. Great, thanks, Nancy. Um, Jimmy, you are up next. Hi, thank you so much, um, Gwendolyn and Lisa. I'm really excited. Um, I definitely just want to just to affirm that I, I do I do agree. I was someone who very early on I worked with Kiko. I worked with Kiko what so while my film was in development, um, sort of having conversations around who this film was for. Um, there is a question here somewhere. I what I did find was that my initial audience, um, I won't say who they were. They loved the film. Anytime I I I tell them what we're doing, like yes, we love it. We love it. It's free. We want it, but but we want it for free. And it's like, how dare you? An indignation. And then, so we've had to kind of sidestep that audience. They, they need the film, but they're, they're, it's really clear they don't really feel they should pay for it. So we've had to go to a second audience and they're like, this should be almost free. And again, so, so I'm in this space right now with the movie and I'll give them credit. We've been able to get some money. So it's not like it's been all bad. We've raised about 60, 60 $70,000 from these audiences but we are looking for to do a bit better than that. So um, we're now looking to kind of reframe the film. So my film's about women of color who left the corporate world due to racism and sexism. And so we're now trying to reframe this and I won't go into it because it's quite technical um, to help in the operational excellence field, to help technical leaders, engineers, scientists who really don't like having uncomfortable conversations, period, use our film as a way to give them a safe space to practice one of the most uncomfortable conversations they could ever have so that they can have other, maybe less uncomfortable, uncomfortable conversations. And so we're in this space now of really, because my background, I'm, my background is engineering and engineering project management. So I'm leveraging off the fact that I know within the industry, even just asking someone to take two days off use their holiday, a senior engineering director will start having cold sweats and, and waking nightmares. So the hope is that using the film could be a way to leverage of that experience. I'm just curious in terms of um, just, yeah, you talked about, you know, and you cast a really wide net and I'm, I'm keen on terms of, I guess any advice in terms, any advice you have, because um, we are, we are looking for what we can get have less conversations, get more income. We seem to be getting some momentum with this organic, with this, with this tact, as long as they don't tag us diversity, equity, inclusion. As long as we're not labeled that, we're, I think we should be okay. Um, but I'm just curious if any any advice in terms of your own kind of calibrating, recalibrating, 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 any tips or tricks? Um, yeah. It it sounds like again that you're asking for fundraising advice, which is no, not no, exactly. No, 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 okay. no, 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 no. Okay. No, what I so what I heard actual say, yeah, stakeholders yeah. and partnerships. Okay. Yeah. Just wanted to clarify. Yeah, what what I heard you say, Jill, is is such a I mean, I would use you as a case study for how to evolve um, and find your audience. That and that's a super important part is. Yes, you want your film to be seen by the audience that needs to see it, as you said, but you also want to be able to support yourself as a filmmaker. And so your, your pivot, I think that was one of, of Angela's P's, um, and persistence uh, is, is a wonderful example of that. You know, oftentimes 
our core audiences, our film's core audiences are not the ones, you know, they might be communities that are impacted and don't have, you know, even nonprofits, as we all know, have extremely limited or no budgets, it seems. Um, and so you're not getting the screening fees that you need, the speaking fees that you need, et cetera. So that persistence that you followed and, and using your mind to expand, um, to see where your film can in fact create revenue for you because no, your film and your work, it's not a volunteer. I don't think this you do this as a volunteer, nor should you. Um, and so finding where that revenue is and connecting with it is brilliant. Um, and that should be, everybody should be able to, you know, use that you as an example. I, I think it's fabulous. And I don't know that I answered your question, but I affirmed you. But, but piggybacking on that, that's why it's easier for your impact team to have that conversation than you, because we have no trouble explaining that the film is not free because it costs you money to make it. <laughs> nor is food at the supermarket free. And it shouldn't be free because people need to be paid for what they do. And if everybody was paid appropriately, then we wouldn't be worried about money. So yeah, that's why um, it's helpful when it's not you having that conversation. Right, thank you. Thanks, Jimmy, thanks. Uh, it was a, a really good question. I, I just wanna add, by the way, that um, uh, we've encouraged you to share your projects in the in the chat, and a lot of people are doing that, which is great. Uh, Mabel also had a great suggestion of um, of putting in our social media handles hmm. and going and liking each other's um, uh, social media pages and just supporting each other that way. So, um, great idea, Mabel. Um, we have two more questions. This might take us a little bit over the 130 time. Is that okay with um, you, Lisa, Gwen, Angela? Okay, well, I just want to respect you know the time. Uh, so Nancy and Joanne, wrap it up for us. Go ahead, Nancy. Hi, um, thank you so much for doing this. I am, first of all, I have laryngitis, so I'm just <laughs> trying to um, get my voice back here. Um, I, my film premiered at Doc NYC and it was super exciting. Um, I've been at some other film festivals, um, a few this summer, and now I'm trying to do an impact campaign. The film is about animal rights through um, two cows that escaped slaughter, one in Patterson, New, New Jersey, and the other one in Jamaica, Queens, and a uh, truck driver, Harley Biker, turned vegan advocate who rescues them. And in the process of my making a film, he was a volunteer at Woodstock Sanctuary, and he ended up opening his own sanctuary in um, New Jersey. Uh, and so the film goes like it's his trajectory and the cows who are now living in, you know, Nirvana. <laughs> um, and so it's about he's very funny, by the way, as a narrator. And um, so uh, the film is about animal rights, and I've started. Um, trying to do impact with, I had a um, partner in Humane League. Uh, they helped me with this community screening that I had um, at East New York Farms in Brooklyn. Um, and that went really well. And so then I met with them again and they gave me their list um, of campuses where there are um, vegan or vegetarian clubs, environmental groups, that kind of thing. So I just started emailing and I only sent out about 20 emails, which I know is not that many, but I got one response. Um, and the person, this was in, they have it in, they had the list from New Jersey, uh, New York, and then also Massachusetts. And so the person was in Worcester. Um, he was a professor there and he said, wow, I'm really interested. The, the student who was the, leading this club um, forwarded this to me and I'd be really interested in seeing this film if, if it comes to Worcester. And I said, oh, wow, I'd love to talk to you about bringing it to Worcester, you know, um, you know, and, and, and any kind of, um, uh, you know, impact that I could do there. Uh, but I haven't heard back from him. So uh, I'm just wondering if this is the best way to kind of launch a campaign. It seemed it's for me because, um, 
it's the group that I really want to reach. And so Nancy, I'm going gonna, yeah. gonna to cut you off for yeah. a second. And because yes. um, I, I think I, I hear what your question is. Yes. So yes, absolutely targeting vegan organizations on campuses is fantastic. It's perfect. So this is where the second, well, some of these P's come yeah. in, patience right? And persistence. So everybody is stupid busy and their inboxes are jammed. Right. So it is never a problem when you get a live one, like you got a live one with that professor to circle back. You could send the exact same email. Whoops, you went away. I can't see you on the screen anymore. I got to change this. Um, you could send the exact same email Again, two weeks from now that you sent to follow up because chances are that person like missed it and will be glad to get the reminder. Like literally I've sometimes sent the, the same email three times mm. and then people are like, oh, thank you for getting back to me. So that's one thing. The other thing with schools is 20 is yes, that's a start, keep going and realize that they are all now planning for the spring. Right. So schools have money, Right. but <laughs> the fall is already booked. I see. And, and what can you hook it to in the spring? So is there some, something during spring semester, which is like International Humane Day or International Be Kind to Animals Day? Like, I don't know what it's called. See mm -hmm. if you can find it and help, help everybody who gets your email see, oh, this would be a perfect time to do something with this movie. Does that make sense? Yes. And I'm gonna jump in with another, um, just a, a quick, so the one example you gave was that the professor had been forwarded the information from yes. a student. Um, what the professor I think needs is to, um, for you to go to that student again and say, can you help the professor organizes screening um, because it's it's the professor you know themselves aren't necessarily uh, you know going to do that they need the support so either you can outline what your goals are and how you want it to look work with the student group get um, in touch with the school librarian see if they'll uh, purchase a copy you know for their library which then pays for the um, the license fee and the screening fees etc. Um, so there's a lot of steps that you can take um, mm -hmm. that would help facilitate it. Um, and, and that's something that we always create so that you have, you know, it's not just one person is responsible for taking it all the way. Um, most people, as, uh, to use Angela's words, are stupid busy. Um, they don't have time to think about all the things. They just like the idea. Now make it happen. Is right. what and, I think oh, we, and by the way, every time that you're you're talking about the fee, be sure you include the fee for yourself, whether you're whether you're going to be virtual or you're actually going to be on campus, that mm -hmm. you also get a fee for your participation. Right. Right. Uh, I think the student graduated. I just want to say that that's why he, you know, he passed it along to the right. professor. Who so then go to the group. But that's OK, because he still knows people who are in that club. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Thanks, yeah. Nancy. Appreciate Thank you so that. much. Um, before we get to Joanne, I just want to mention, uh, after, after Joanne asks her question, I know Malika is here from Doc NYC Pro, and um, I know you're um, just releasing information to, uh, um, and tickets for the conference. No? We are, but not till the 5th of October. Okay, but the so I will um, come back to another D word event closer to that date. Okay, well, I'll just mention that um, the link to the what what the conference sessions are now are online. Yes, so, they are uh, online. Do you put yes. in the chat the link? Absolutely. Give me one second. Okay, very good. Because there's a distribution day as well, um, so it's relevant okay. to this conversation. Uh, Joanne, you said you could come on camera to ask your question. So if you could do that. Mm -hmm. 
she mentioned in the chat she's she's a video challenge today but uh if you if you can't do that uh, just ask it um off camera we can hear you if we can't see you uh, all righty maybe not going once going twice ah joanne okay well um <laughs> We are over anyway, and and uh, I just wanted to again thank Lisa, Gwen, Angela. Thank you so much for um, for this time today. Um, and another shout out to Dempsey and Lori. Thank you for for coming on and doing the um, consult. Good luck with the project. Thanks for having us. And oh, yeah, yeah, and can I jump in and say, Doug? You know, I I mean, I'm probably going to start crying because I. Yeah. I'm so grateful to you for the vision of founding D Word and for fostering this like beautiful community that just keeps growing and getting richer. Because as you said, we need each other. We we it's too lonely out there. Yeah. And so thank you for inviting us back. Great. Thank you. I mean, you know, and, and the world needs all this creativity and, and reflection. And that's what documenting does. So yes, thank you to everyone who yeah. makes a part, who's a part of this community. Yeah.